All right, so today we're talking about gear, specifically my documentary rig that I use on almost all my shoots. Before we do that, I just got my yellow fever vaccine and uh, my arms are sore, so I'm gonna head to the gym, work out, get the star moving, hopefully feel a little better. That was good, arm feels great. Swim a little bit, such a nice day. We're gonna be talking about the rig that I use for all of my commercial work and all of my documentary work now. I built this rig up over time. This isn't something that I just magically bought all the pieces. I've really kind of fit and tailored this exactly to how I like it. So I'm gonna drive home and you guys are gonna watch me speed through putting this thing together. All right, this guy right here, best piece of documentary film gear. This is my yellow fever vaccine card. I can't get into Africa without it, which means it's an essential piece of gear. But anyway, before we start talking about this rig and breaking it down and talking about why I've added all these pieces, I wanna take just a quick minute to talk about my philosophy when it comes to equipment and buying gear. Because if you're a mechanic or a chef or a firefighter, you rely on equipment to do your job, your knives, your wrenches, your lifts, your Nomex suits, all that stuff. So when you pick up that gear, you need it to work exactly how it's supposed to every single time. And so there's definitely a reason to buy the high-end professional gear. You get better weather sealing, you get higher quality files, better bit depth, better audio quality, all of these things. But ultimately, the best gear you have is the gear that you have right now. And that's not to say that you could change things out to make things sound better, look better, all that stuff. But the gear that you have right now is the gear that you can go out and make something with. So that is, that is the best gear in your arsenal. So, and I say all that to say this, I don't want you guys to feel like you have to go out and buy all of this stuff in order to make films or make documentaries or that this is even the best rig because there's definitely higher quality cameras, better audio recorders, better microphones better time code boxes, everything, there's, there's better of it than what I have right here. So this is the rig that I have built up over time. I've added pieces, I've taken them away. And that's what we wanna talk about is why I've built this rig, why it's the best rig for me. And so I think there's really three things that you need to look at when you're building a rig and that's image quality, audio quality, and your comfortability using the rig. So those are three things to keep in mind while we're talking about this, but let's jump in to the core of this rig, and that is the camera. So the core of this kit is the Nikon Z6 II. I know people are gonna hop into the comments and chew me a new one for using Nikon or using a mirrorless camera in general or telling people that you can make documentaries with mirrorless cameras. You absolutely can. There are obviously better cameras than this. You can shoot on the, you know, an FX6 or a, an Ursa Mini Pro or C300 or C70, whatever. But like I said, your comfortability with your camera is more important than the camera itself. I've been using Nikon cameras basically my entire creative career. My parents have been using Nikon cameras, like film and digital cameras since the 80s. I'm extremely comfortable with a Nikon camera. I can pick it up, I know how it's gonna work. It just works for me. And so for me, there's really no reason to switch to Canon or Sony when I have cameras that I really enjoy and I can get a really good image out of it. So really enjoy having the Z6 II. And I think overall, just talking about not just Nikon, but just mirrorless cameras and smaller bodies in general, for me have some advantages over the bigger bodies like the FX6 or the Komodo or the C70, is these things are so light and small that you can carry them around all day. So like this documentary that we're headed out to shoot in Africa, I'm gonna be wearing a camera on my shoulder for eight to 10 hours a day. And I want something that's gonna stay light stay light on my shoulder so that I can use it all day because a camera that I can use all day is better than a camera that I can't. So that's one of the major things for this. I can also just strip it down to just be a body and a lens with the monitor on top, keep the rig really small, and then I can throw that thing anywhere. I can fly under the radar. And that's not something you can normally do if you've got a big FX6 or an Ursa you're not gonna really be able to fly under the radar with that. For me, I would much rather sacrifice image quality for mobility. Being able to take these style cameras and put them anywhere I want and take them anywhere I want, for me far exceeds the, the need for extreme image quality. So, but speaking of image quality, I do still get a good image out of the Z6 II. We've shot some beautiful films on it. 
I shoot everything externally. I record everything to the Atomos Ninja 5. That's what everything is being recorded to right now. I love the Ninja 5. Even if you're running a rig like an FX6 or a C300, you're using an external monitor anyway. So adding a Ninja 5 really isn't adding anything to the rig that you wouldn't already have on a bigger rig. So I love running the Ninja 5. I can power it off a V-mount. I've used this V-mount on the Ninja 5 for like two days straight without killing it. So that's a huge plus for me. And the Ninja 5 just takes your standard two and a half inch SSD drives that you would throw on a laptop or something. And those are significantly cheaper than using CF Express Type B or CFast cards. One terabyte of those two and a half inch SSDs is like a hundred bucks. A terabyte in CF Express Type B is anywhere between $350 to $600. So I'm saving a ton just on memory and that allows me to just shoot more, which isn't always better, but especially when you're, I'm going to Africa, I wanna, I wanna overshoot for sure because I can't just go back to Africa to get scenes that I didn't get. So that ability to overshoot and know that I'm not gonna run out of space, huge benefit for me. And the Ninja 5, everything is recorded in 4K, 10-bit ProRes, beautiful files to work with and everything looks great. I would say there's been very few instances where I've like blatantly run into issues where I'm exceeding the camera's ability to record a scene. Of course, there's very high dynamic range scenes that I can't capture everything in the highlights and the shadows. But for the most part, this camera has been able to do 95% of the things that I've asked it to do. And for that other 5%, I rent or I borrow a C300 or a Komodo or an Ursa and those get the job done. So I've really enjoyed having these cameras. And of course, you can't run a camera without lenses. So let's dive into these. I generally take three lenses with me on every shoot. The 8514, the 3518 that we're recording on right now, and the 14 to 2428. These three lenses help fill kind of the three visual voids that I like to work in with all of my projects. The 85 is something that I've been shooting on for a long time. It's the first lens I bought after having a kit lens. It's just, it's a beautiful portrait lens, which is the original reason I picked it up. And then transitioning from photo into video, I really liked the the ability of the lens to get in close on my subject and to really compress everything in the frame together. It just gave just gave everything a really nice feel for me. And so that's probably a little unorthodox. I think people would prefer to shoot on maybe like a 24 to 70 or run a 35 or a 50 handheld on the shoulder rig. But really for me and my style, I have really loved using the 85. So it's a beautiful lens. It's the 1.4G lens. So it's actually an F-mount lens. It's not a mirrorless mount lens. But I really like the I really like the tone and the feel of the lens, especially just how, especially if I'm shooting it wide open, everything just feels really soft and dreamy. It's been a beautiful lens. It's an absolute tank. I have beaten the living heck out of it and it still keeps going. So my other two lenses, the 35 is my absolute favorite for environmental interviews. I really like to bring in more of the scene when I'm interviewing somebody and so, and not just have it just the person. And so 35 really helps with that. It's, you know, of course, a little bit wider than 50 and you can get a little bit closer to your subject and it can feel just a little bit more intimate. 14 to 24, of course, is just a beautiful lens for capturing space. This is the lens that pretty much lived on my camera the entire time I was down in Yosemite. And I mean, of course, if you're in Yosemite, you wanna pull in as much of that landscape as possible. And the 14 to 24 did that extremely well. And so all three of these lenses are built super well. They're all weather sealed. All of them, except for this one, I'm able to throw a helio pan UV filter on. I highly recommend using higher end UV filters, especially if you have nicer lenses, you don't wanna put a cheap UV filter in front of really nice glass. That just doesn't make any sense. Helio pans are great. They're a brass ring, so you're never gonna bind it to the outside of your lens or anything. They've been great. They have saved me. I dropped a 17 to 35 once and it broke the Helio pan UV filter, but it did not break the front element. Speaking of filters, we need to talk about virtual, virtual? That doesn't make any sense. Speaking of filters, we should probably talk about what I like to use for variable neutral density filters, and that is Polar Pro. Polar Pro stuff has been fantastic. This is not the last time you will hear me mention them in this video. Really loved all Polar Pro stuff. Their customer service has been great. The very few times I've had to use it and their filters have been absolutely amazing. For a while, I used the Peter McKinnon Mist Edition 2 and these things were absolutely great and I still use them fairly frequently. The only kind of qualm I had with them was especially if I was shooting outdoors, I could get some, some glare on the front element of the filter and especially since you can't run like a lens hood or anything like that when you're running these filters, 
it just makes it hard to control that glare on the front. Flares can be great sometimes, but the glare was just washing out the image and that was mildly frustrating sometimes. So of course you can kind of mitigate that sometimes by putting some like gaff tape around the outside, but that happened a few times on shoots and that is when I switched to running the VND map box. This is the base camp system from Polar Pro. I believe they still advertise it as the industry's lightest full VND map box. I don't know if that's still true, but it is definitely very light. Even if I'm just running it bare with no rails mounted to the front of the lens, it's not really adding that much weight and tipping anything off balance. So I've really enjoyed running this rig. It allows me to swap filters really fast. There's a tension knob here on the side. The filters come up. You can swap out from a two to five or a six to nine, or if you're doing hard stops, whatever. The filters all have these great little grippies on top so you're not getting your grimy little hands anywhere near the glass, which is perfect. Really love the system. To me, all the Polar Pro stuff just seems very well thought out. Every time I, I go to do something on it, there's already like a key there or a, a, there's an Allen key built in or like even just little things like this or the extra texture that they put on all the little knobs and stuff. Polar Pro stuff to me has felt just very almost over the top thought out. And so I've really enjoyed all their stuff. Of course, it's a matte box. You have the actual box part and you have the flag. So that's everything when it comes to cameras and lenses and exposure and all that. Next, it's time to move on to arguably the most important part of any film, and that's audio. Audio can be this often overlooked aspect of documentary filmmaking, especially like run and gun style or low budget films where you may not have a dedicated audio person and you're running a rig like this just by yourself. And I think a lot of people tend to focus on image, which is undoubtedly important, but if your audio is bad, you're kind of toast. You can have some shaky footage or some blown out footage or soft focused footage, but if your audio is bad, like you're absolutely toast. So having solid audio equipment and understanding mic placement and lab placement is absolutely key when it comes to shooting a good film. So for recording audio on my rig, I use the Zoom F6. I typically mount it right here in the front on the underside so that I can see that everything's recording and I can see my tracks moving. And now I have a dedicated audio recorder that is attached to my rig. So that's been super great to have a high quality audio recorder that is getting the signal from the microphone up top. It has three different power options. I always have a set of AA batteries in the battery sled, it takes four AA's. You can also power it off of a Sony L-Series battery or you can just power it off of USB-C. From that field recorder running, I love the Mogami gold cables. This is the only thing in this rig that I haven't paid for. Somebody gave this to me, very kind of them. I love the Mogami cables, very quiet. It was weird. I wouldn't really say I'm an audio person. I just had like a cheap like three foot patch cable that I was using originally to go from the F6 into the microphone. And then somebody, I, somebody recommended the Mogami and I used it and it was shocking how much noise this cable gets rid of. So. Mogami, and then it's going into the Deity S-Mic 2S. This thing has been my absolute favorite mic and honestly one of my favorite equipment purchases in the last like two years. It's a short shotgun microphone, so it's a little bit shorter than like an NTG2 or a Sennheiser MKH416, which means it has a little bit wider pickup pattern, so you're not having to worry about being as directional with your microphone as you would be with those longer shotgun microphones. It's all brass, no buttons, you just plug it in and make sure it has phantom power and it's good to go. It's got a pretty low self noise of like minus 74 dB. I really like it for my voice and male vocals especially, it's got a really rich low end, not quite so bright in the high end. So DD has been great. It's also got a coated soundboard so it works really well in high moisture environments like if it's really humid or like you live in the Pacific Northwest and you're always shooting in the rain. It's been a really good microphone. I feel like I've, it's really added a lot to my kit. Another thing, especially for documentaries, your subject always needs to have a lav on them. I think that's an absolute must because they're gonna be saying things maybe under their breath or they're gonna you know, walk away and say something or they're gonna be thinking through and processing something maybe while you're shooting something else. And it's really great to have those little sound bites of audio all the time. So I have really loved the Zoom F2s. They're not the best audio recorder by any means. Definitely the lav that they come with, I would recommend replacing it with even something like the DD Pro Lav, or if you really want to step it up to like the Sync and Cost 11D, the lav that it comes with is not not the best. But I've really loved the recorder. It's it's about the size of like an AirPods Pro case. It's really tiny. Runs off of AAA's. I love just being able to swap batteries out. I don't have to like plug it in via USB-C like you do the Tentacle Track E's. 
It's just been a really great recorder. It only records 32-bit float. You can select if you want it to be 44 or 48 kilohertz, but you basically turn it on, press record, lock it. You can throw it in a pocket. You can clip it to someone's belt. It's great. And they're not too much money, so I'm not like terribly worried if like I put it on someone and they run off or crush it. And sometimes I will even lav myself and make sure that everything is synced via time code so that I can talk into my lav and make notes so that as I'm listening back to the footage later, I have notes of what was actually happening in that moment. So cool little pro tip there. All right, you know, I said the Deity S Mic 2S was probably my favorite gear purchase in the last two years. That was up until I got these Deity TC1s, not sponsored by Deity or Polar Pro, but if you wanna sponsor me, I would happily accept. So the Deity TC1s have been an absolute game changer. Back in January of 2020, I shot a documentary down in Costa Rica Really enjoyed the process, really enjoyed the film and what we were able to capture there. But editing was an absolute nightmare. It just took, we came back with I think 15 hours of footage and just syncing that either manually or using DaVinci's auto sync via waveform feature just took forever. And so I was very adamant that I needed to get a timecode kit. And so there's plenty of timecode kits out there like the UltraSync Blue, the Tentacle Syncs, but there's a few things, and I'm not gonna go super into detail because I'm making a video specifically about the TC1s and why I chose them. But the three main reasons that I chose the TC1s, I wanted something with an LCD screen so that I could visually confirm, obviously I can't see frames, but I can confirm that everything is at least close, right? Love that it had the screen and that there's a menu on the screen, so I can change settings if I need to on the fly, which is, the, here's the second reason, I don't have to have my iPhone. There is an iPhone app so that you can go in and change things and sync everything via the iPhone app and Bluetooth, but you can sync all of these together just by the cable or you can sync them via RF. So those are huge things for me. I didn't wanna to have to use an iPhone, especially in the field. What was the third thing? On to little accoutrements and the actual rig itself. So again, I'm not sponsored by Polar Pro, but I love all their stuff and their attention to detail. So the actual shoulder rig that I'm using is the Polar Pro Pivot. This thing has been absolutely incredible. It is an extremely light shoulder rig, lighter than many of the other ones that I've used. Very much slimmed down from other shoulder rigs that I use. No nonsense, thing just works. So it's got these handles in the front that are adjustable. You can move them to whatever is comfortable for you. You can adjust them to make them longer. Plenty of quarter 20s, there's a quarter 20. If you can see it down here on the bottom, these little there's these little caps on the end that unscrew, that have a rosette mount and a quarter 20 in the center, which is what this little magic arm is mounted off of. In the back here, you have the actual pad, which folds. You can collapse it to, collapse it to just be a pad. You can have it be something that will catch on your shoulder and you can extend it out just to give you some extra length. It's been an absolutely great rig. The whole pad comes out and there's a dovetail in the bottom so you can go straight from a shoulder rig to a tripod rig. It's been an absolutely incredible rig to have. Like I said, their attention to detail is great. Everything uses the same Allen key, and that Allen key has a cute little magnet spot on the side, so you can adjust everything on the rig on the fly, and the rig stays pretty light. Actually, I've never weighed it before. We should weigh this. All right, it's like a little over 13 pounds, so if you add the F6, probably at like 14 pounds. And that's with pretty much everything on it. So that's that's pretty good. A 14 pound rig, being able to carry that around all day really had no issues. So that's my rig. It's not the best rig. It doesn't have the best camera or the best microphone or field recorder, but it's the rig I have and it's the rig that I can go use right now. So if you got any questions or wanna know anything more about the rig or the gear we're using, please, Drop something in the comments below. Be happy to answer any questions, but until next time, we're gonna go use this thing.